Today we're talking about dodging and burning and choosing your aperture when taking portraits. Cool, what time is it? That's right, it's time for Q&A. Hey there and welcome to this week's Q&A. If you got a question about photography, Photoshop, Lightroom, camera settings, whatever it is, leave it in a comment right down below. And if we choose your question, you'll win a free month of Flurm Pro. You'll get instant access to hundreds of advanced tutorials, Lightroom presets, Photoshop brushes, and Photoshop actions. All right, guys, let's get into the questions. How can I use content to wear non-destructively, like on a new layer? So there are a ton of effects that you cannot apply on a blank layer in Photoshop. Content to wear is one of those, liquify is another one, lens flare is another one. So the best thing to do is to create a new layer and go to image and down to apply image. So you can apply that effect onto your new layer and then map Ask out everything else so you only see that effect on that new layer. Hey Aaron, how do you decide which aperture to use when you're shooting a portrait? So for the most part, when I'm choosing my aperture, I've got my depth of field in mind. And depth of field basically has to do with how much of your image is going to be in focus. A shallow depth of field means not much of your image is gonna be in focus. And a wide depth of field means more of your image will be in focus. So your depth of field is influenced by a few different factors, including your aperture, your focal length, and your sensor size. For instance, if you're shooting with a wide angle lens, more of your image will be in focus at the same aperture than if you're shooting with a telephoto lens. So it's not just aperture that controls your depth of field. But in general, the wider your aperture, the shallower your depth of field is going to be. So if you want your background to be out of focus, I recommend shooting at f1.4 or f2.0 or f2.8. If you want everything to be in focus, I recommend shooting at f8 f11 or f16. Now keep in mind as those aperture numbers go up like f8, f11 and 16, you're gonna be letting less light into your camera, which means you're gonna have to use a longer shutter speed or a higher ISO. So if you need that light, that's another case in which you wanna use a lower aperture like 1.4 or 2.0. So in the end, the aperture that you choose to shoot a portrait is gonna be based on your decision whether you want the background in focus or out of focus and how much light is present in your scene. And there are some lenses that are really great for shooting portraits like a 50 1.4 and an 85 1.4. Both of these will allow you to get a very shallow depth of field and not have distortion in your portrait. I wanna ask about some good sites with free stock images. So I'm gonna leave this one to the community. I want you guys to comment down below where you find your best free stock images. When I'm looking for free stock, I usually use the website Pexels or StockSnap.io. These sites are great when I'm looking for my favorite photos of tomatoes or seagulls, a couple pieces of salmon with some salt sprinkled on it, people pretending they're on a phone call, handsome Labradors, pills sitting on a leaf, some weird pods hanging from a tree. Oh, I think those are papayas. And of course, cats. How do I take decent photos with a low-end DSLR? When I first got started, I thought that the camera and the lenses I used made a huge impact on the quality of my photos. Nowadays, I pay way more attention to the quality of my light than the quality of my equipment. Bad lighting is going to make a bad photo no matter what camera you're using, and good lighting is gonna help make a great photo even if you're using a relatively inexpensive camera. And the best thing about light is you don't have to pay for it. There's interesting light all around you. All you have to do is find it. Pay attention to the time of day that you're taking pictures. Early in the morning during sunrise and late at night during sunset are known as golden hour and these tend to produce beautiful photos. You can also take pictures from interesting angles like really close to the ground or really high above something. If you're photographing something that's inherently interesting your pictures are probably going to be interesting too so look for great things to put in front of your lens. And these days low-end digital SLRs can still produce great images and don't forget about the budget mirrorless cameras out there they're totally disrupting the market and in my opinion they're forming the future of digital cameras. I wanted to know about the image format while shooting with a digital SLR. What's the difference between shooting in RAW and shooting in JPEG? So there are a lot of advantages to shooting in RAW, and my recommendation is to always shoot in RAW. You can always convert to JPEG later, but a RAW file is going to give you a lot more information than a JPEG file will. So a JPEG is basically a compressed file format. It takes all the information in your photo and squeezes it all together to try to save file size. And when it's squeezing all that stuff together, you you lose a lot of information. A RAW file is going to be uncompressed and it stores your color and light information in different channels, which will allow you to edit those channels separately in post-production software like Lightroom or Photoshop. 
So for instance, if you don't get your white balance perfect in your photograph, you can change it very easily in a raw file and it's not going to destroy the photo. In a JPEG, it's really hard to change your white balance if you don't get it right. Oftentimes it's gonna look way too yellow or too blue. A raw file will also give you more space for editing both your highlights and your shadows. So let's say your shadows came out a little bit too dark, you can increase the brightness of your shadows without destroying the information in your image. So as a general rule, I always recommend shooting in raw. There are a ton of advantages that are going to make your images higher quality. And really the only downside is a little bit higher file size, but these days storage is pretty cheap. So I'd rather have the higher image quality and I can always delete or convert these images to JPEG if I need to save space on my hard drive at a later date. How can I get tack sharp photos straight out of the camera? By tasty chocolate. So there are a few things that influence how sharp a photo is going to be. And most of those things have to do with the lens on your camera. So in general, a prime lens, which is a fixed focal length, like a 50 millimeter 1.4 or an 85 millimeter 1.4 are going to be sharper than a zoom lens, like a 24 to 105 or a 16 to 35. Each lens also has a maximum sharpness. For instance, a 50 millimeter 1.4 is going to be sharper at F8 than it will be at F1.4. And you can look online to find the maximum sharpness for all kinds of different lenses, or you can do your own tests. Another factor that influences sharpness is the quality of the glass inside of the lens. For instance, if you're using an entry level lens, it's not going to be as sharp as a more expensive advanced lens. And if you're really concerned about sharpness, there are manufacturers out there who make very special lenses that are incredibly sharp. Now these are a lot more expensive than your normal lenses, but they do produce great results. Another thing that influences sharpness is your shutter speed. If your subject or your camera is moving at all during your photograph, you may see a little bit of motion blur in your photo. The faster your shutter speed is, the less motion blur you're going to have. So whenever possible on a bright sunny day, I recommend shooting with a very fast shutter speed or shooting with an external strobe that'll allow you to freeze motion. And if you do find yourself in a situation where you can't shoot with a very fast shutter speed, be sure to put your camera on a tripod, which is gonna keep your camera sturdy to get more tack sharp photos. Holy crap, you have the best selfies that I've ever seen. Oh, you mean these selfies? I'm a big fan of long exposure pictures, but I've got to spend so much time outside at night. I wish I could shoot long exposure pictures during the day. How can I do it? So the deal with a long exposure picture is you're using a very long shutter speed, which is gonna let light in during your entire shutter speed. So if there's a lot of light present, it means your exposure is going to be really, really bright. So that's why for the most part, you have to shoot long exposures at night. You can also reduce the amount of light that's coming into your camera by using what's known as a neutral density filter. This is basically a piece of glass that's really, really dark. You put it in front of your lens and it keeps that light from getting into your camera. Landscape photographers use neutral density filters all the time, especially when they wanna take pictures of water and make it look like it's nice and smooth. Now they make a bunch of different types of neutral density filters. Some will block less light and some will block more light. If you wanna block more light, look for a higher number of stops, like a 10 stop neutral density filter is gonna block a lot of light. They also have variable neutral density filters, which will allow you to change the amount of light that gets into your camera. And they have graduated neutral density filters, which will block light from just the top or the bottom of your camera. And these are really cool for shooting landscapes. You can make the sky a little bit darker and still properly expose the ground. Can you explain, is there any difference between different types of dodging and burning? Medium gray layers, black and white painting, luminosity painting, curves adjustment layers, painting on a mask, standard dodge and burn, and so on. So here's the deal with dodging and burning. Basically, you're making part of your image lighter and part of your image darker. And it's usually used to enhance detail in a photograph. So you're basically just making a photo lighter in some areas and darker in some areas. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of different ways to do this. And there's not really any right way to do this, but there are some things that I would stay away from. The most important thing you can do when dodging and burning is to make sure you're doing this non-destructively. This means you're not editing the actual pixels in your photo. This is why I recommend staying away from the dodge tool and the burn tool in Photoshop. These will actually destroy pixels. The next thing to keep in mind is that you basically wanna make your image lighter and darker, but you don't wanna change colors. So if you're gonna be using a curves adjustment layer to do this, I recommend setting the blending mode to luminosity so it doesn't affect your color. And other than that, there's really no best way to do it. You can just paint with white on a layer and then change that layer blend mode to soft light and change your opacity to get it right. You could use a curves adjustment layer, 
You can make a 50% gray layer and paint white and black on that. You can use exposure adjustment layers. You can use levels adjustment layers. The most important thing is that you work non-destructively, meaning you can turn this off or on at any point in time. And the end result, is this gonna help your photograph? And if so, you did a good job. So find whatever method works for you and stick with that. There's no need to go changing things up if you got something that works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Last question. Hey Aaron, I'm gonna set up my own studio at home. Can you suggest or recommend some essentials for setting up my own studio? There are some really great things you can pick up for a home studio that won't cost a lot of money. And the first is a seamless backdrop. I recommend getting a white backdrop and a black backdrop. Basically, these are just giant rolls of paper. You put them on a couple of light stands and then roll them out and your subject can stand on a totally white or a totally black backdrop. This is a really inexpensive way to create professional studio looking photos. Next, I recommend getting some lighting. If you're just starting out and don't want to spend a lot of money, I recommend getting work lights from a hardware store like Home Depot. These produce a lot of light and they're not very expensive. Think of them like really powerful light bulbs. So you can see that light on your subject. It'll allow you to actually work with that light and get the results that you want. Now, if you don't add any diffusion, these lights are going to be really hard light sources, which means you're going to get harsh highlights and harsh shadows. So you probably will want some sort of diffusion. You don't have to spend a bunch of money here. You can go to a fabric store or use a bed sheet and simply hang it up in front of the light. So you photograph the light through that bed sheet onto your subject and it should be nice and diffused. You can also point these lights into the ceiling or into the walls of your house. The light is gonna bounce off the ceiling or walls and then go back to your subject and it's going to be a large, bright, diffused light source. I also recommend getting two or three of these lights so you can play around with different setups. You can put lights in front of your subject, behind your subject, to the left and right of your subject, above your subject. You can get all types of different portraits based on where you put these lights. And the last thing I recommend for a home studio is to connect your camera to your computer with a USB cable. This is called shooting tethered. Basically, it allows you to see your photographs on your computer as you take them. This will help you pay attention to the details in your photograph and see things that you wouldn't see on a small camera LCD. It's also gonna help you judge your exposure. You have a much better idea if you're overexposed or underexposed based on the image on your computer. Kombucha on tap is also nice. I highly recommend it. And now I'm gonna ask you a question. So earlier we talked about capturing great images with low-end DSLRs, and I think that the budget mirrorless cameras are going to make a huge difference in the future of photography. So here's my question to you. Do you think mirrorless cameras are going to make up the future of photography, or do you think that DSLRs will continue to have a place? All right, guys, that's it for this week. I can't wait to see what you think the future of photography is gonna be. And don't forget to leave your questions for next week right down below. Thanks so much, I'll flirt you later. Bye, everyone. My arm hair is so pretty when I comb it. I think we lost him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, what? <laughs> Come here. <gasps> Intros and outros with Koa. Yeah, I'm going to let you get comfortable where you're going to be doing. Koa, the camera's right over there. Koa. Oh, will flirt you later. <laughs>